Okay, welcome everybody. We're going to get going. Um, so, uh, yeah. Make sure to do the stuff that we always ask you to do. <laughs> like, subscribe, I don't know. Um, and lpitara.org. And yes, okay. Everybody knows what to do. What, Lori looked confused. Check out, check out Rabbi Yaakov Klein's website, lpitorah.org. Check out all our videos on Breslov Thornhill channel on lpitorah.org. And check out all of our videos on the YouTube channel, Breslov Thornhill. And uh, that's really it. You're talking still. They don't hear you. Okay. <laughs> Res of Thornhill. Yeah. Okay. So you probably have to sign. It. You probably have to sign in yourself first. You have to like make your own profile and sign in, and then you can subscribe. Okay. I'll wait till I get a friend over. Okay. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> okay. That's what friends are for. All right. <laughs> okay. So we're in the middle right now of chapter number seventeen. Seventeen. And um, we're, we're holding on page 316 of the book um, at the section called Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Yosef. Um, so when we last left our hero, he was, he was traveling through the desert and searching. He left the settled parts of the world and came to the desert. And, and he found a, a, a tremendously large person who didn't seem to be human at all because of his size. And he... He was carrying a big tree, and the giant asked him, Who are you? And he said, I am Adam. I am human. And the giant was astounded and said, It's been so long since I've been in this desert, and I've never seen an Adam, a human, here. And so we spoke last week about, uh, about just the, the difference and the mindset of Malchus, and that, and that Malchus, the Malchus existence, is really a very dualistic type of existence where we have a lot of ups and downs and we have very high highs and we have very high lows and that the whole universe is created, that this is our pat pattern of growth. This is the, 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 the work of our entire lives. And, and it's definitely the, the pathway and the history of Klal Yisrael has always been like this. And so we said, it has to be that the Mashiach and the Malchus based David, Mashiach, and the, the kingdom of, of, of David HaMelech has to come from this type of place. So David HaMelech himself was very high. He brought and prepared the ground and, and started the building of the base of Migdash, <clears throat> right? But on the, and he was anointed uh, a king. He was anointed king, right? But on the other hand, he also had this, this wild situation with Bathsheba where he appeared to do an Avera. And from what we learned, it seemed like Hashem made that happen. A Gezer a Melech, a degree from the, from the king. Why? Because that's the way that the Bnei Yisrael have to be. That's the way the Malchus Beis David has to be. We have to go down and then come back up. There's many explanations in, in Kabbalah and Hasidus why it is that we have to have these ups and downs. One of the most important ones that we've discussed many times before is that Hashem didn't, didn't create the world perfect. Hashem created the world that it needs to be perfected. And the method of, perfect, of, of us helping Hashem to perfect the world, He wants us to play our part in it, is that we have to go and find those sparks of holiness that have been shattered and cast down, deep down. And the only way that we can get those sparks is by going down into the dirty places where they are and, 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 and liberating them and freeing them and making that tikkun. So we have to be going down and, be go and bringing those sparks back up all the time. That's the way it has to be. So our ultimate salvation, we said, is going to come through Melech HaMashiach, Malchus Beis David, which is going to be highlighting and showing all of the universe that this was always the plan all along. And the fact that the, that the, that the Jews were so downtrodden for so many years and experienced such difficulty and suffering, right, was all implanted in, in the first place to be like this so we could elevate those sparks and help to, help to perfect the world. 
So we find ourselves now beginning, welcome Vered, on uh, on page three sixteen, Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Yosef. Okay, so the idea over here is that we're going to be looking at and contrasting the difference between the viceroy and this Grace Amench Adam Gadol giant of a person who's carrying the tree. And we're going to spend most of the whole class today discussing the differences and seeing from different perspectives who is the viceroy and who is the giant and, and what are the lessons that we can take from it, right? So the first way that Rabbi, Rabbi Klein explains two ways, Rabbi Weinberger sort of explains two ways, one of them overlaps. So we have a few different ways. But the first way is really, I think, the sweetest way and, and, and the way that has the most positivity in it. And it goes like this. We may all be familiar with the concept of, of Mashiach, right? That there's an ultimate savior, right? Who's going to come and going to be the, the, the king and is going to bring us out of Golis, bring us into Eretz Yisrael, cast out the enemies and build the base of Mikdash. And through that, he will herald in the age of Deya Es Hashem, where everyone has this, you know, Tered Tika Stima, the, the top level the hidden the secrets of Torah will be revealed and we'll have a total paradigm shift in our in our mindset and in our existence. Totally amazing, right? So that that Mashiach who's gonna welcome Rafi. That Mashiach who's gonna come and actually like like be the head who, who brings us through and brings us out out of Gullis. That's called Mashiach ben David. That's the, the Mashiach from the house of David. But there's also in, in Jewish thought Another Mashiach, which is called the Mashiach ben Yosef. And the Mashiach ben Yosef is sort of viewed as, in general, general uh, Jewish thought, as the Mashiach that kind of prepares the ground for Mashiach ben David and builds everything up. So in the, the, the story of Mitzrayim, right, in Egypt. So before Moshe Rabbeinu came and actually led us out, Moshe Rabbeinu was the Mashiach, the Mashiach, what we would call like the Mashiach ben David, even though he preceded David, right? But the one who actually like stood there as the leader and took us out, Yosef Atzadi came down a long time before and started laying the groundwork and building everything and preparing everything so that we would be in the situation where we'd be able to come out. So these two aspects are, are the, is the standard view of Mashiach ben David and, and Mashiach ben Yosef. However, Rabbi Klein takes it to a totally different different way of looking at it, like this. So, like we said, David HaMelech is not the type of person who was always even killed, who was just, you know, he, he was born tzaddik and never changed, just was always, you know, like, uh, I always like to say, like, it always, I always think about the Svas Emes, who was born, his grandfather was the Chidush Arim. Right? Who was he was born into Hasidic royalty. Like every day of his life, he was in the 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 house of 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 the Gera Hasidim. Like you know, what what choice did he have really? <laughs> and he was born a Tzaddik and a Talmud Chacham. He just was always on top, right? So he kept going. This was not the life of David Amelech. David Amelech was like a lonely boy who liked to go out into the fields and he was a shepherd. He was mocked. And his greatness was discovered. And even after his greatness was discovered, he came from lower roots. His greatness was discovered. He was anointed as king. And even when he was anointed as king, he was, he, he was chased. He was, people tried to murder him. His own son tried to murder him. And he had this aver with Bathsheba. He had tremendous ups and downs, right? And he eventually, like we're saying, laid the groundwork for the base of Mikdash to be built. And he is the one who the Mashiach is named after, right? So that's the life of Mashiach ben David, going up and down and struggling and fighting, right? Fighting in the trenches and then achieving the ultimate victory. That's Mashiach ben David. But Yosef at Tzadik was very different. Yosef at Tzadik, right? He, had, he might have had a little bit of a difficult life, but he had a test with Aisha's Potiphar, with the, with the wife of, of Potiphar, a, t- a test in the realm of sexual purity, right? And he passed it. He never failed. Yosef at Tzadik was a Tzadik from birth, and he never failed in his tzidkis, in his righteousness, right? He was always on the top. 
So it's a different type of existence, right? He's called Ish Matzliach. Oh, right. right. He's the a person who is successful. Just when Yosef tried to do something, he was Matzliach. It was just easy, no problem. Right. Sure. Send you down as a slave to Egypt. Next thing you know, ruler of the land. No yeah. problem. <laughs> no problem. You know, like. You can't keep this guy down. Can't keep him down. Ish Matzliach. <laughs> right. Things, so just, just, things just go. As, a, a, as opposed to David Melech, I'm just yeah, contrasting yeah. a little bit. You see, even in Sefer Tehillim, which is you know written with Ruach HaKadosh, of course, and he's already been king, and it's written at different times, but like even then, he's so tormented. Yeah. And he's feeling such low lows and such high highs, and it's all, he's pouring that out in, in Sefer Tehillim. Right. Like even besides for the facts of his life, he's like you're saying, he's like a tormented soul. He's yeah. like... Uh, He's going to see what we're going to call in the next chapter. Yeah. He's a, he's a moon person. But we'll get to that when we get to it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, 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 so he comes. The viceroy comes. The viceroy is clearly a Beis David type of person. Right? Who's failing and rising up again and failing and rising up again and, and crying and, you know, he's doing the whole thing. And he comes to see this person who is just a giant. And he's carrying a tree. He sees a giant who's carrying a tree, right? And and it's a striking it's a striking figure. And so, you know, what's the difference between these type of people? What's what's the difference? So so really, the giant carrying the tree is is supposed to represent this idea of Mashiach ben Yosef, or of Yosef Atzadik, and the viceroy is supposed to represent David. And we see another story which which really explains these two these two sides very nicely, so nicely, maybe the best one which is the difference between um, Yosef and Yehuda. Because Yehuda is the, of the 12 brothers, the 12 tribes, Yehuda is the tribe that the kingship comes from. Yehuda precedes, obviously, David and Melech, but it has to come from the line of Yehuda first, and then afterwards from the line of David. So Yehuda is where the, the Mashiach bin David comes from. So in, in those, two, those two brothers who existed at the same time, we have this very same meeting, right? And we see that they both fought and they both struggled, right? But Yosef, who never failed, right? He has one letter of Hashem's name, right? This is brought on page, uh, page uh, what's it called? Yeah, page 318. Um, Yosef, he has one letter from Hashem's name in, in, in his name, the Yud, right? I think it's talking about the He. Is it the He? In, in, in Navi, yeah. There's uh, somewhere later on in Navi, I think it's quoted. I don't remember where... Uh, he's called Yehos- Yehosef. Oh, with, they added on hay. to him. They add a hey to his name, Yosef. Yeah, it's in uh, footnote 40. It's uh-huh. from uh, Tehillim, where he's called Yehosef with a hey. Part of Shem Hashem, right. Yeah. Oh, so he's given an extra hey. He's given, right, yeah, he's yeah, yeah, given right. an extra right, hey, right. which is also part of the So he gets an extra hey added on to his name. Right. Right. Because, yeah, and that's showing that he was, yeah, he was a, he was a tzaddik, right? And he overcame his test and he, he did great. But like, he was always riding on top. Amazing tzaddik, Yosef tzaddik. He gets the extra letter added to his name, the hey. Mashen Ken Yehuda. What happened with Yehuda? Yehuda had a situation where he had a seemingly inappropriate relationship with Tamar. And it was sort of hidden. And then it came out in public. She, she masqueraded as a prostitute and, and ended up having uh, relations with him. And then it came out in public and she had his uh, signet, I think it was, right? That she was able to show that who the, who, who the father was, and then she became pregnant, she was going to have a baby. And Yehuda stood up in front of everybody and basically took responsibility and said, it's me. I'm the one who did it, and I'm taking responsibility for it, and I'm doing tshuva, right? This was a tremendous Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying the name of Hashem in public. Everything that happened to Yosef was in private. And, but Yehuda went through this tremendous fail, shamed in public, took responsibility, did tshuva, and came out on top, and, and was a Kiddush Hashem because of this. Right? So, which, which letter of Hashem's name did he get into his name? All of them. <laughs> right? There's a Yud, K, Vav, K, all in the name Yehuda. Right? But not only that, even further to this, the, the most amazing part, the awesomest part, is that he didn't get something, Yosef got something added on afterwards, right? With Yehuda, it's shown that the name of Hashem was always there with him. 
Like it was always meant to be. This is the way that his life had to be. Hashem planned this to be this way from the beginning. And, and in, an, in a sense, it's holier. It gets more of Hashem's name. The guy who struggles and does the right thing and struggles and does the right thing. Right? This, this gets all of, all of Hashem's name. And not only that, it was always there. Even from the beginning. Right? What a tremendous lesson. Totally amazing. And then you see that this bas call, this divine voice, came out from heaven anyways. And uh, the lesson is, many yatsu kavushim. Meaning that from me, Hashem is saying, from me did this hidden thing emerge. So again, showing his name was how already had the shame Hashem in it to show that really this was all from Hashem to begin with. And uh, it comes out, even though Yehuda didn't realize it at the time, what he did actually had what seemed to be a very inappropriate act actually had a strong halachic uh, basis to it based on the halachas of Yibum. Tamar was his daughter-in-law and it you know, and you see that this Mashiach ben Yosef, that uh, Mashiach ben David, that we're talking about, all stems from this, from this Misa. Right, it all comes from that. Yeah. But but also, I mean, it's brought down. I don't think Rabbi Yaakov talks about it a lot in the book. But th- these two opposing kind of uh, lives um, are represented in general by the sons of Rachel versus the sons of Leah, and you see it manifested in in, in a bunch of different ways. Um, you see, going back to Rachel and Leah. Um, Leah is the one who, who, who is Yehuda's father, uh, Yehuda's mother, and it says that she wasn't so. Her eyes were were kind of foggy, and she didn't see things. She didn't see so well. Some people interpret that to mean that she wasn't uh, as pretty as good looking. But the, the the deeper meaning behind that is you see that with Yehuda, with with Leah, with the sons of Leah, sometimes it looks like something's going on that doesn't look quite right. But on the inside, in the mm-hmm. in, in the emes, really everything is totally fine. Yeah. As opposed to Rachel, everything is perfect. Yaakov loves Rachel. He, as soon as he sees her, instant love, right? Like this is what she's beautiful. She's perfect. Everything she does is perfect, and, and that goes down to to the children as well. And um, some coat of, the, coat of many colors. Coat of many colors. Favorite everything sun, looks appearance. great yeah. on the outside. Everything is good on the inside. It's just this sort of model of perfection, um, and and you see that. Um, some of the explanations of the, the arguments that, that took place that led to the selling of Yosef uh, were also based on this, right? Some of the things that, um, one of the reasons why the brothers were upset with Yosef was because it seemed that he was tattletaling on some of the things the brothers were up to. So what were the brothers up to? I don't remember all of them. Maybe you can fill in some. But one of them, for example, was Yosef would see the brothers of Leah. They kind of had a click. They would hang out together. Yosef would see them uh, eating animals without proper shrita, necessarily. Eber menachai. Eber menachai, yeah. e- eating, eating a limb from an animal that was still alive, it seemed. And he sees that. He's like, what, what are you doing? You can't, you can't do that. And he goes and he tells... I'm telling dad. He te- I'm telling dad. <laughs> right. Um, it turns out the, the, the medrash tells us, or I think it's the medrash that tells us, that this animal that they were eating from was some sort of Kabbalistically, magically created animal with Sefer Yetzirah, with yeah. using the Sefer Yetzirah written either by I think Adam Arishon or Adam Avram, Avinu. Avram Avinu, depending yeah. who you ask. Um, they created magically created this animal, and an animal created in this way doesn't require shechita. So, as far as the brothers were concerned, and the and the actual truth was that they were doing nothing wrong. But Yosef, even if he knows that, he says, "One second, though, this looks wrong, and you can't even do something that looks wrong." Mm-hmm. That was the, the Mahalach of Yosef right. and, and, and the world of Yosef and the world of Rachel versus the world of Leah and the difference, Leah between, and difference between the striking figure of the, 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 the giant it looks like a giant yeah. right? has the appearance of a giant right. as opposed to the Viceroy who's just fighting for years and years and years and is dirty from, from, from traveling and working and, and going up and down you know a very big difference yeah. so it's interesting so Rabbi Yaakov over here is kind of he, he sort of is trying to say that we need both of these, and that they're both great. But he's heavily leaning towards the greatness mm-hmm. of the Viceroy and the greatness of the of the base David side, right? So he says, like uh, you know, the, the famous Chazal that in the place that a Balchuva stands, even a Tzadik Gamor can't stand. Right? There's something the fact that that, that David struggled and did chuva, the fact that the Viceroy is struggling and, and doing chuva makes him in a higher place than than Yosef or than the giants, right? But he says two of the both of these paths are necessary, and and we can see them in in the giant and in the viceroy. 
Okay. I, I guess so. So, so the giant asks, right? The, the, uh, an awesome part, by the way, just to wrap things up over here. If you look at page 322, at the very top, finishing off that section, this is one of the sweetest things he wrote over here. So, after a moment of hesitation, he overcomes his initial fear and approaches this colossal being. Somewhere in the world, a little boy is reading a Pusik in a sweet sing-song voice. Vayigash elav Yehuda. And Yehuda approached Yosef. It's Mamish, the Parsha of Vayigash, where Yehuda comes and approaches Yosef. That's what's happening right now. The Viceroy, who's, who's representative mm. of Yehuda, is coming now and approaching the big tzaddik, Yosef. Totally awesome. Anyway, so, so the, uh, the Viceroy comes to him. And what does the giant say to him? He says, who are you? Right? Like, what are you doing here? Who, what, what, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you are. And so he says, he says, I am an Adam. I am a, I'm a, I'm a human. And the viceroy says, wow, I haven't seen, I've been in here for a very long time in this place. And I haven't seen a human before in this place. So what's, what's going on here? What is, uh, this is uh, some quick lessons over here. So he brings the word for Adam can, can relate to two separate existences. It can relate to the concept of, of Adama, which means, which means the, the ground, the earth, right? Which is lowly and physical and, you know, the place of, theoretically, of dirt, right? And there's another place where it references the Pasuk that says, Adame I, I can, I am, I am, I am similar to, I become similar to Le'elyon, to the upper, upper heights, in other words, the word Adama itself can be low, the lowest of the low, or it can become like, pretend to be, the highest of the high. Right? This is him describing himself. I'm not like you, he says. You're the guy who lives here, and, and you've always been here, kind of. Like, you're, you're this big, powerful figure carrying a tree. Right? We're going to see, talk about what the tree means a little bit later. The tree can mean powerful Torah knowledge. The Torah is called Eitz Chaimhi. Right, you're carrying this tree. You're a t- you're the hugest tzaddik. You're here. This is your place, right? And it's 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 like as if he has been here all along. But this little little viceroy over here, the Adam, has gone from Adama to Adame Leelyon. He's gone from being the lowest of the low to the highest of the high. And the 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 the, the, the giant is like, how could how could a person like you? You're the little person. How could you be here? And his answer is, oh, see, we're very different. I've been there and back again. I've gone to the lowest of the lows. I've gone to the highest of the highs. And I'm looking for something that you don't even know about. I'm going to a place that's going to be way beyond here yet. Right? And that's why he says, I, you're not supposed to be here. This place is supposed to be, this place of, we're, at, we're now like, we're getting close to the end of the journey over here. We've gotten to a very high place. And this high place is where this big tzaddik lives. It's the place of tzaddikim, Right? So he's looking at this little, this little thing and saying, how could you be here? And basically, the vice is telling him, oh, I see, you don't get it. <laughs> this is just a stop. I'm going much farther than this, right? And, and my derech is the way to get to the, to get to the palace of, uh, of gold, the, the mountain of gold Pearl. and the palace of pearls, right? And, he, and he's, he, he says, he's like, what are you talking about? Mountain of gold and palace of, palace of pearls. This is this is this is this is silliness. This doesn't even exist. What are you what are you talking about, right? This is the the the, the contradistinction between these two people, right? So you, you see that you here. see that represented in one other way that uh, Rabbi Nachman brings in in Lukutim Aran elsewhere. In the word Adam, it's made up of two two parts. On one hand, it's Dalad Mem, which is Dam, which is just flesh and I mean blood, flesh and bones. He's he's just that that lowly aspect. And the other part is the Aleph, which is representing the, the higher realms and the, the bringing the Hashem into, into the Basar Vidam. And that's now he's been able to integrate those two parts of himself. And this really, you know, the first time I went through this book, um, I was a little bit confused because in the beginning of the story, when we're talking about the nature of the Viceroy, it's all about how he's, he's the inner Tzaddik, right? He's un, he's, he can't be messed up, right? Like the princess, she got messed up. She went to the realm of evil, whereas the viceroy represents the tzaddik and it never stops. And, and then the story goes on. It's like, okay, one second, he's, he's falling and he's falling and he's falling and he's falling and he's falling. What happened to inner tzaddik? 
But then when we get to these chapters here and we start to explain, okay, wait a second, uh -huh. there, there's yeah. actually, there's one, there's more than one kind of tzaddik. Right. Tzaddik doesn't just mean this guy who's perfect, infallible, doesn't do averas, doesn't have a Yitzhahara. Even the guy who's up and down, up and down, can still embody this aspect right. of, of tzaddik, can still be a tzaddik, and a very high level tzaddik, and maybe even a higher tzaddik, yeah. for sure a higher tzaddik. Yeah. He's gonna, yeah, he's gonna go much higher, right? Yeah. So, um, so I kind of said the way I explained it is not really exactly how he explains it. I kind of, I, I, I changed the script a little bit, but, but, um, in, in just, just in, a, in, in a very simple sense that just shows us something else about the viceroy that that, that Rabbi Klein says, is that, you know, the, the the viceroy didn't really say to him, oh, see, you're 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 nowhere near as holy as I am. That's 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 our interpretation of it, right? But he says, like, ironically, at this point, the viceroy doesn't even realize where he is. He doesn't even think that what he's doing is so, like, he hasn't accomplished anything, right? So let's just read um, the bottom of 324, the last part of, the, of 324, not in the gray box, just to finish up this chapter and, and uh, segue to the next thing. It's very sweet, though. But because he is completely unaware of what he has achieved, this humility, simplicity, and weariness encapsulates the Viceroy's true greatness. The Baal Tshuva constantly feels as if he is only just beginning proceeding with a simple sweetness and sense of modesty. Not knowing where he is or the reason for the giant's great wonderment, this human among giants begins to tell his tale. Right? So in other words, he's still on the journey. He's still just fighting and he's not stopping. He's, he's, he's doing what he has to do and he's trying. And he's, fa he's, he's found himself in a place of greatness. But he doesn't even really, he doesn't even really realize it or doesn't really care. He's, st he's just on his journey with simplicity. Very, very sweet. Right. Okay, let's move on to the next section, and uh, we got a, a lot of stuff to say over here. Sure. Should we see if there's any uh, comments or questions on 17 before we move to 18? Anybody here? Anybody online? What you just said about the the guy that's had the ups and the downs, and the ups and the downs can become the tzaddik, just gave me a little bit of hope. Right. <laughs> Okay, so wait for this chapter. You're gonna have a whole new, a whole new level of level of hope. <laughs> okay, let's go. So uh, you want to read the? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay, chapter eighteen. So we'll read inside from the the text of the story. Three twenty five, page three twenty five. Yeah. The viceroy told him the whole story and about how he was searching for a mountain of gold and palace of pearls. The giant responded, "Certainly, this place doesn't exist." He repressed him, telling him that his mind had been led astray by folly for it was clear that no such place existed. The viceroy began to cry very much, for he was certain that the place existed. The giant repressed him again, saying, It is certainly folly. And the viceroy said, It certainly exists. That's it? That's it. Okay, so this is a really awesome idea that we're going to see here. So Rabbi Klein gives us another way of looking at the two people over here. Okay. Um, we'll start with Rabbi Klein and then we'll go to, to another interpretation from Rabbi Weinberger that is very similar. He actually brings from him over here also. But so Rabbi Klein says like this, there's two types of people in the world. There's sun people and moon people. Yes, these are recorded. That's going to be on YouTube. Someone just asked a question. Sun people and moon people. So sun people, he says over here, if you look on page 326, are shallow, vain, and drawn after externalities. With no grand aspirations for their personal development, they live lives free of inner struggle and failure. Their lives are not marked by the endless search of a stormy soul for the deeper meaning of existence. Right? So we're talking about a person who just goes about their life, is kind of a surface level type of person, I would say. Right? Maybe you could say superficial a little bit. Right? But it's not really, doesn't appear to be in search of anything. Right? The, con the contrast, the other side of a stormy soul. Just a person who... Content. Content, who seems to just do things that society wants him to do. And, you know, like you ever see, uh, you ever drive, or I don't know, you ever see people who are out like, like I can't imagine a, a, a religious Jew just sitting out, like in the middle of nowhere, doing nothing. <laughs> right? Like, uh, like having a beer. And I mean, maybe for the odd time, but some people spend their whole, like all, all, all of their downtime, just, you know, relaxing the beer in the backyard 
I don't know, like watching TV all the time, like doing nothing. And just, that's the way, this is life. I'll never forget, one time I gave a class and happened to be a non-Jewish person came to, came to the class. And uh, it was early on in the Lukut Imran series, like years ago. And, uh, and, and so afterwards, the, the non-Jew came over to me and was like, yeah, you know, it was, it was very, very interesting. Everything was very interesting. You know, if you're interested in becoming a better person, and I, I thought to myself, like, the thought never crossed my mind that, uh, that someone would not be interested in becoming a better person. And the per this person was like, yeah, you know, I guess if you, if you really want to work on becoming a better person, I guess that's very interesting, right? Like, who, who, what Jew would ever think such a thing? Like, it's not, it's not part of my whole existence is to become better, to, to grow, to change, right? Totally crazy. Anyway, sorry about that. But, but uh, different types of people, right? Different types of people. So, so moon people, on the other, on the other hand, are, are totally, completely opposite to this. The moon people are, let's see what he says over here, in touch with the loss of the princess in their lives. These Jews feel compelled to embark on a soul journey, an epic search for the inner dimension of Yiddishkeit. A moon person is a person, like everybody here, almost by default, is a moon person, right? There's just, you, you, you're looking for something. You're searching for something. You feel very, very strongly that something is missing, that I need to find something, right? And I have to be, I have to be on this journey. Listen to this quote, please. Look at 327 at the top. This is awesome. There's a few amazing quotes in, in this chapter. This is from Rav Cook. These people never have any rest. They are always in a state of drama. Either they are ascending to the sublime heights of heaven or they are descending into the bitter depths of disaster. These people need to concentrate on spiritual growth every day. Such people, when they have discovered ways of life that suit them, will ascend higher and higher. On the other hand, if they neglect their personal paths, they will most likely collapse and descend lower and lower. Constantly, that's the end of the quote, constantly aspiring towards greater vistas of religious life, these Jews are always rising and falling. Right? We're, on, we're searching for something, and we're bothered by it. So we gotta, we got to be working towards it, but, but we can't quite get it yet. So we're going up and up and up and up, and we're trying to find it. And then when we don't find it, we're, we're so broken, or when we can't quite reach it, it's so hard for us that we, that we fall down. And we sink and we sink until we're ready to start trying again. But it's only because this type of Jew is so in touch with the fact that something is missing. And, 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 and is, so, is so much the Viceroy, because we know about the princess. There's no doubt in our minds that the princess is out there waiting for us to find her. And there's for sure a mountain of gold and a palace of pearls. There's no doubt. We feel it. We know it. And so we, we're striving for it. But when we can't quite reach it, we slip and we go down. And then we got to start again. And we got to keep going up like the stock market, right? It's supposed to go. The, the other... Yeah. way that that can uh, manifest, as he mentions in the footnote on that page, is um, a, mo a moon person tends to um, embody this idea of tachlis ha'idiya asher le'neida, which means the pinnacle of knowledge is to know that one does not know. So somebody who's a seeking soul, they're seeking and they're seeking and they're finding and they're finding. And the more they're finding, the more they're realizing, oh my gosh, there's so much more to go. So it's... It also manifests as the highs and the lows that come yeah. from falling, actually falling. Right. But sometimes even if you're a moon person, even when you're going up, you feel like you're actually going backwards oh, and getting lower. Yeah. And for that, to, to feel good about that, you have to come on to the other um, um, princess characteristics that the struggle is, has value in itself. Right. And it's not just about getting to the top of the mountain. It's the journey itself also has value. The struggle, the journey, the desire itself right. all, all has value. Right. But yeah. the, the other thing you know, about this whole idea about sun people and moon people, and maybe people have heard this idea expressed differently in, in, in other ways, but if somebody has been a moon person their whole life and they're seeking and they're climbing and they're falling and you're like, what's the matter with me? Like, there's something seriously wrong with me. And it's so validating yeah. to see that this is like, <laughs> this is this is a real thing. It's by design. It's written in Sfarim, not just Yaakov Klein Safer, but this is like from Rav Cook already 100 years ago. And that's rooted in other things. Like, this is part of the design. 
if you were made a moon person, you're a moon person. If you were made a sun person, you still might be able to be a moon person. But <laughs> it's um, if you're lucky. It's if you're lucky. If you're lucky, right? Who would who would th who would have thought that like if someone put before you like okay, you could either be a sun person or a moon person. What's better? Right. You would think probably that it's more stable and more conducive to like just a, a you know growth and progression to be a sun person. So a sun person would level. say, I want to be a sun person. Right. <laughs> no, but so, I'm saying even a moon person could think sometimes like, oh, if only I was a, yeah. if I didn't have to, to deal with all these struggles, ups and downs, ups right. and downs, ups and downs. Yeah. You would think that like moon people are, are just striving to be sun people. Right. But that's we not. Be, we, we can't do it. We got to be. We gotta no, so I'm saying, so you have to come to, you have to come onto something like this that says, no, there's tremendous value yeah. in this struggle to be like this, to be who you are. If this is who you are, right. it's worth something. So, so he says he, he goes on it's to okay. say, <laughs> "Yeah, for sure. You know, it's it's not only okay, right? Yeah, but but so, so he says he says like this. He says, don't think that uh, that it's only sun people and moon people, and that it's a hundred percent distinction. Right. Really, we're all made up of some kind of mizug of of the two, right? And we have certain sun qualities, certain moon qualities. Some people are more moony, some people are more sunny." Right, so so that's something to know. But and he says, where does it come from? Where did this work? How does someone become a sun person? He has a few interesting ideas that that can that can be you know useful information for 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 some of us. And that is that you know it could be that um, the reason why a person goes out of the realm of the search, right, and to do, to, to 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 be a, a moon person, to be to be a viceroy, you have to be out there you have to be open you have to be vulnerable and you have to give yourself you have to really put yourself into it right could be that a sun person became a sun person because really they tried to be a moon person and in that struggle and and the failure that they that they experienced and maybe the maybe they were mocked maybe they were betrayed maybe something happened at that point and they said you know what i can't uh, that's enough i'm not opening myself up ever again I'm not putting myself into something ever again. So they close off and they're not searching. They're just trying to be an even keeled, good Canadian person who has a salary and a, you know, picket fence. Oh, that's American, but okay. <laughs> right? That could be, that, that, that could be where it came from. But let's, let's. Well, I mean, I, like, unfortunately, yeah. you know, even this is a. Uh... This is something that happens in, in schools often, like, you know, kids, yeah. when they get to a certain age and they can start sort of thinking more abstractly, they, they might have hard questions that the teacher either doesn't know the answer to or doesn't want to give the answer to. And I mean, I can I can attest to this. People will ask questions that are hard questions, you know, religious questions about Hashem, about different things like that, about souls. And sometimes the answer that, that's often given is we don't ask questions like that. Yeah. You know, like, don't don't think too much. Don't stop being a moon person. Stop, yeah, essentially. It's just like, you know, read, read the Pasuk. Read the, we're learning halacha here. Like, don't stop the search. Yeah. yeah. You stop say the something, search. Jeff? I, I'd like to ask a question. Yeah. Can the Rav give me a few different characteristics of what a sun person is versus what a moon person is? Okay, so let's, uh, let, let's based on that, let, let's, let's try to explore this a little bit. So, one one of the interpretations of a sun person that he gets into a little bit over here, but that that Rabbi Weinberger really gets into because this is this is like Rabbi Weinberger's bread and butter, right? Is that a, a, sometimes a sun person? What's the sun person? The sun person is this giant who's in the in the desert, the place of where where only tzaddikim can grow, nothing else can grow there, right? And he's carrying a tree, which represents Torah, a giant tree. He's carrying along with him. Not a branch, a tree, right? And and this this person can represent a certain type of Talmud Chacham. A type of Talmud Chacham who knows a lot, right? Who really he, has... He's not the tzaddik, though. No. Yeah. Re, he, I'm saying, Rabbi Re, Yaakov says very clearly, he says, you might be enticed to sort of mix the two explanations. Because right. we were doing two explanations of the giant, Right. The first explanation was the Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach ben David, David. Yeah. those two different types of tzaddikim. tzaddikim yeah. But yeah. sun people and moon people are not necessarily yeah, different. tzaddikim or not. It's just a personality type. Right. But you could have a, a sun person who is still a Talmud Chacham. 
even though he's not a deep seeker right. up and down, he could still be a Talmud Chacham. He's not necessarily a Tzaddik. So in this in this interpretation, the sun person is 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 a, is a leader, a Talmud Chacham, maybe a Rosh Hashiva, maybe a big rabbi, right? But but this person is 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 very different from the viceroy and from the tzaddik. This person knows a lot of Torah and knows all the details of all of the all of Shas and all of Paiskim and, and Halacha, right? But if you go to this person, but that but that's where this person lives. And this person is not moving anywhere from this place. When you go to this person and you say, I'm I'm trying to find the lost princess. And she's in She's on. She's in the gold, uh, pearl palace on top of a golden mountain. You know what he says to you? He says, "What are you? What are you stupid? Medication. Yeah, <laughs> you need to be medicated. Such a thing doesn't exist. This doesn't exist. Mishigana. Focus on on only learning facts, <laughs> right? This doesn't exist. You are wrong. And he's carrying a tree. He knows so much Torah. He's a giant, right? And this is." This is, this is the first of the big maniyas, the, the things that prevent you from actually going to find the princess. Such a person is an expert in the surface level and, and carries tremendous weight and power and can stand up to you and look you in the eyes and say, this, this stuff that you're, that you're learning over here, these desires that you have, forget about it. You're, you're being a silly child. Right? This is one aspect of the sun person. The tree that he's carrying, right? Very interestingly, it has many branches, right? It's a big tree with many branches, but it's detached from the ground. It doesn't have roots, right? So he, um, he brings over here this Mishnah in Avos. If you look at the bottom over here, page 333. One whose wisdom exceeds his good deeds. To what is he similar? Says the Mishnah, to a tree whose branches are many and whose roots are few. The wind will come and uproot and turn it over, right? So the tree with all the branches, this is, a, this is all the Torah that this person knows. But the roots are what root it down into, you know, into the princess, into Emuna, into, he, if you look at the top of, by the way, it's a good, a good set of adjectives over here. Top of page 332. Lacking a sense for the spirit of our holy tradition and the imperative role, the lost princess of Emuna, prayer, Hispoididus, Yiras Shemayim, Simcha, simplicity, sweetness, humility, yearning, and broken heartedness must play in a Jew's relationship with the master of the world. Does not have any of this. And so he'll stand there and tell you, what, you're crazy. What are you doing? You can't do this. I, uh, one of the things he said, he's talking about this person as a Lamdan. A Lamdan means someone who's, who, who's learned a lot, right? So he said, Rabbi Weinberger said, why don't you go Find your local lamdan. You, you, everyone knows these type of people, right? In in our in anybody's city, local lamdan, who knows a lot of Torah, but it's just like not having any of this deep stuff whatsoever, right? Go to your local lamdan and say, you know, I, you know, tell him that you are hyper focused <laughs> on finding the lost princess, and that this fable story that Rabbi Nachman wrote is the deepest thing that you've ever seen in your life, right? What's that person going to say to you? They're going to literally respond to you like this giant. <laughs> They're going to say, what you're talking about doesn't exist. You're cuckoo clocks. It's time, it's time to put this aside and focus on learning Gemara and Halacha, which are fantastic. We should all learn Gemara and Halacha, by the way. Just we have to also have the princess. That's the... That's the... <laughs> right? So this is one of the aspects of, of, of a sun person. One of the ways of seeing it, right? Um, the other way that he sees it, which which Rabbi Klein also brings over here, <clears throat> is um, is uh, is in relation to. There's another. Okay, it's so one thing. Minios, miniot, right? This word means barriers, blockages, stoppages that stop you on your journey, prevent you from accomplishing what what you need to accomplish, right? It's a very common word in, in Breslov, and it's something that we talk about also, always when you're trying to go and visit a tzaddik. You'll be faced with tremendous minias. When you try to go to Uman, you'll be faced with tremendous minias. These things that come up, wild things that you don't expect to come, out to come up to try and stop you, right? So this is what this guy is, what this son person 
giant with the tree is, right? So what are the factors? What are the manias that are preventing us on our journey? This type of person that we just said is one of them. And by the way, if you take the word manias and you rearrange the letters and you realize what they really are, it becomes ni'imus, right? Sweet, mm. sweet, sweet, tasty things, <laughs> right? Yeah, these things that were actually, you thought they were manias, you thought they were, they, they were things that were blocking you and were the worst things that ever happened. Later on, when you look back with that, with that backwards vision that we talked about before, you're going to see they were actually ni'imus. They were actually the best, sweetest, most amazing things that ever happened to you, right? Anyway, the second, the second way that Rabbi Weinberger explains it, that he also brings over here, is what else do you have that tries to shut you out of your mission and tries to make you think, stop, stop this foolish business that you're in. Quit looking for the princess. Quit spending so much time on this silliness, right? Is, is people of, again, of tremendous stature and tremendous knowledge, but in like secular areas, right? You'll have people in your life that will come to you and say, you know what, I am an expert in medicine, philosophy, whatever. You can have the biggest atheist who is the biggest, most logical, you know, PhD this, PhD that, whatever, whatever it is. And he'll say, I can conclusively, conclusively prove to you that there's no such thing as a soul. Right? What's he saying? The thing you're looking for doesn't exist. The princess doesn't exist. The castle and the pal- palace don't exist. And what's, what's the response that any one of us would give him without any thought whatsoever? Is, you're wrong. I'm sorry. I know that it exists. I know it. And I'm going for it. Right? <laughs> These are the type of people, powerful people, who will say to you, what are you, what are you crazy? Religion? Studying religion? Don't you know? It's 2022. Right? Despite the fact that for, since the beginning of creation, until, you know, 100 years ago, every single person in the world believed in God. <laughs> and now people are getting too smart and they think they got it all figured out. Right? That's, that's a whole different, different way of looking at it. But you're going to have such people who stand up and say, listen, the, uh, you, 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 know what, uh, you know what really you are when you, you think that your brain is, is, you know, things are stored in your brain or your neshamas, your soul is in your brain and that's what's making you alive and everything. You know, you know what that is? It's only electrical pulses. And I'll show you. I'll put it, I'll put you on a, an electroencephalogram, right? And, and I'll hook you up and I'll tell you, I'll tell you a joke and you'll laugh and you'll see this part of your brain will start to show electrical activity. That's all you are. You're just electrical activity. It's all an accident. You just happen to have grown up this way, and that's it. There's no such thing as a soul. There's no such thing as a, certainly no such thing as a princess and a golden mountain and a palace of pearls. You are crazy. <laughs> Get with the program. There's no such thing as a soul. I believe strongly that if any one of us here, if anyone came to us and said, there's no such thing as a soul, I can prove it to you. I'll show you on my fancy soul detecting machine, right? <laughs> We would all say, I'm sorry, you, you, you're wrong. I know for sure that it exists. I know that it's there, and I'm going for it, right? This is another aspect of sun versus moon in and of the, the uh, what's it called? The, um, the giant versus the viceroy that he says over here. No? Yeah. So the, Holy, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Holy and Hill once said, what the human mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. So there's no limit to what we can do if we can believe it. Right. So that gentleman, the man that said you're crazy, it doesn't exist, will never reach that level, whereas the person that believes it's possible will might might attain that level. Right. So what was the beginning of the quote again? What the the human mind can achieve and believe no no or the believe. human mind can conceive conceive and believe and believe it will achieve right so mm-hmm. that's good i was asking because i wasn't sure if you said see or not because that, that's what i was going to say there's, there's one other footnote here that um uh it's on page 328 footnote four where it talks a little bit more about uh, sun versus moon and he says, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he says that sun people are kind of, um, th- they're characterized by things that happen in sunlight during the daytime, right? Working, going to business meetings, production, factories, 
working in the fields, all that kind of stuff, like daytime kind of work, where it's like what you see is what you get, right? Some people say, uh, you know, I'll believe it when I see it, uh-huh. right? If I, if I can't see it, it's not there, right? You can't see a soul, right? So versus moon people, he says, you know, until we had light bulbs, whenever that was 100 something years ago, nighttime was, you couldn't see things. You couldn't, you at least couldn't see them accurately or fully. Right, you could see things by moonlight, by by firelight, but you know, kind of outlines and not quite see. And he says, you know, the the the, time, the nighttime is when I'll just read a little bit here. Uh, in the moonlight, the tzaddik sits alone in the privacy of his home, crying bitter tears over the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash at Tikkun Chatzais. The nighttime is when humanity leaves the world of things and enters the silent space of the spirit, ripe for religious engagement and qualitative pursuits. Indeed, Rabbi Nachman teaches that the primary time for his boidita, speaking out to Hashem speak, uh, personally, and nullification of the ego is not during the day, during the reign of the sun, but rather at night, when the air is no longer filled with the spirit of shallowness and physicality. That's so, awesome. Yeah, totally, to- totally, awesome. totally awesome. So n- nighttime, night people, moon people, it's this more spiritual, you know, not, not uh, I'll believe it when I'll see it, but I'll see it when I believe it. Right. There's also a big guitar in the nighttime because of that, because it's mm-hmm. there's so much uh, so much holiness. Yeah. But so so we're we're painting a good picture here. We're starting we're starting to see something here, and and you know I like to ask this question a lot. Which which person do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? Right. He says a few other things here. What's the uh, what's the sun person like? The sun person, right, is like a snide comment here, a scornful glance there. The sun person causes us to rethink the entire journey, right? The, the way that they that they're like over here, right? He'll say something like this on page 335. Why are you always running after tzaddikim, performing segulais, attempting to delve into the Torah's inner light? Don't you realize that you're wasting your time? Have your failures not taught you that you will never find what you're looking for? <laughs> Have mercy on yourself and listen, to, listen well to what I'm telling you. The place you are looking for simply doesn't exist. Right? This is what a some person says. So, but what does the viceroy say? The viceroy falls to his knees and cries and just says, I, I know that it exists. I know that it exists. So Weinberger says that, that, that you see there's a, there's a back and forth where he says it doesn't exist. The viceroy says, I'm sure it exists. He says, no, you're wrong. It doesn't exist. But then when the viceroy falls to his knees, I think this is actually the next chapter, the viceroy falls to his knees and cries, that's when the giant actually says, okay, something changes when he sees the, the vice fall to his knees and cries. And he says, okay, I don't think that it exists, but I can see that you're very stubborn, which is an important trait in Kedusha, that Rabbi Nachman taught, Akshanus de Kedusha, right? And so, I'm going to try to help you. <laughs> right? But what changed over there, you know, what happened? I think, there's a few different ways of looking at it, but something that just strikes me as very, very obvious is that is that the, 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 the giant is struck by seeing the absolute truth and absolute conviction of the viceroy. And he sees that he's connected to something that he doesn't have that connection to. Right? He sees there's something deeper, deeper going on than he experiences. And maybe he starts to realize why this tiny little person is here and with, with the power that this, that this little person is packing with them. And, and it's through that, that, that the viceroy just opening up with tears, letting what, what's in come right out. I know for sure that it exists. I, I'm not stopping. Right? This was a powerful experience over here. So this is the people, this is the type of person that, that I need to be. Right? I can't be the sun person. I have to be on this journey. And whether I like it or not, I have to go down often. <laughs> and then I have to go back up again. And, and it's a difficult journey and, I'm, and we're fighting all the time. But, but I can't not do it. It's part of me. It's part of who I am. I have to do it, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a quote from Theodore Roosevelt in here. I don't know if you read this. This could be <laughs> like my favorite quote of the whole book so far. <laughs> it's so amazing, this quote. I'm going to read it out right now. It's, it's totally amazing. Listen to Theodore Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, 
whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Wow. Isn't that like the best quote? Wow. Right? So the only thing that, that we have to change over there is that we know that we're ultimately going to see victory. And we're, we're going to find the princess. Rabbi Nachman told us already. It's going to happen. It's, we're going to find the princess in our own way. Right? But I, I, I like to ask this question again and again. Who do you want to be? Do you want to be the person that's searching, that's trying to find something amazing, that's actually worked, that's trying to be inspired, that's trying to know enthusiasms, who's trying to do, accomplish great things, right? Who's working, who's trying, whose face is marred from the struggle, who's been up and down and up and down and is still going, right? And who knows that at the end, right? If, if at the end, whatever's going to be is going to be, which is a silly thing for a Jew to say, but, 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 but at least... You, 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 like, who would want to live? Who would want to live a life after learning the Torah of Rabbi Nachman? Like, there's, there, it's, it's one of the very few things in my life that I would, I would never ever live without. <laughs> I could never go back and say, okay, fine, you, you want to give me ten million dollars, and I can never open Rabbi Nachman again. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think for more than a second. I couldn't do it. There's no way I want to live my life without what we have, and without. The, the, the journey that we're on, right? This, is, this struck me as very powerful from, from, from Theodore Roosevelt. And I believe that we all feel this, each of us, you know, in our own way and, and uh, in our own connection, we all feel this as absolutely necessary. So um, the, the last thing that he finishes off with here, which is also super awesome, is just that one of the ways that we see this also is that once, once we connect to what we're doing, once we connect to, 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 to this pathway, and once we realize we see ourselves as the viceroy in, in whatever way we experience it individually, right? He says, when a Jew gets in touch with the singular mission he was sent to accomplish, the essence of his personal journey in Oilam, in Oilam Haze, nothing can deter him from pursuing it. When we really click in and we really become the viceroy, when do we become the viceroy? When we realize that we've, we've talked to the princess and we're, we're going. We're on our way. We're finding her. Nothing's going to stop us, right? Nothing is going to take me off of my, of my path now, of my, of, my, of my journey. I was thinking that, that you know how, uh, like the, the way that it clicks in, I was thinking, you know, you have a certain life before you have children. And then when you have children, all of a sudden your life is very different. You somehow, without really realizing it, went from a person who would you know, be somewhat selfish in whatever, and wouldn't think in a certain way, to a person who, without even thinking, would throw yourself in front of a car to save your, your kids, would jump in front of bullets to save your kids. Like, without, there's no question in your mind. Well, why? Because you know that as soon as you have those kids, that is very clear to you that this is number one in your life's mission, Right? Is that, is that you, you have to take these kids and you have to protect them and you have to do what you can with them. And so, when they're little, especially before you have to start fighting with them, right? When they're little, <laughs> when they're little, there's nothing you wouldn't do to save those kids and to protect them. Nothing. Because your whole life is about that, right? So too, in a similar way, when, when a Jew gets plugged in to, to this spiritual reality of the fact that we are the viceroy, and the fact that we're also the lost princess. And we can feel it. And we, can, we, we, can, we, we have this palpable sense that we're on this journey. And that we're going we're gonna to keep going. And we're going to be successful in the journey. Right? The more that we, that, we, that we put ourselves into that journey and into that path, the stronger we are connected to it. And the, the more we're, we, we live this life where nothing can stop us from pursuing it. So... Yeah, I think with that, unless uh, you have something else to add there, I'm not going to say the end part here. No, I think that's good. That takes us to, uh, to the end of chapter 18.
Any questions or comments or additions? Uh, Sandra, what do you got for us? That's a sun person telling you that, by the way. <laughs> right? If I could just point out, if, if you don't mind, that, that you, you just said something very, very profound, that it used to be a certain way, and now when you sit with your family, it took you years of struggling and building up strength to be able to sit with, with that per, the, those, the son person and have them say things to you, and you'd be okay, right? It's like, it's like you know, you're, you're now the viceroy standing in front of the giant, like you made it to a new place where now you can be there and, and they can be saying things to you and you can be like, I know, I, I know, I know where she is. Can you help me find her or not? <laughs> can I, I just want to share one funny story. So yeah. I'm sitting with my dad, he's telling his, his my great aunt, standard or study Kabbalah, blah, blah, blah. And I turn to him, I go, dad, don't worry, I study the hidden and the revealed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that made everybody feel much better. <laughs> Any other uh, comments or questions or well wishes? What do you got? What do you got? So first of all, the moon and the sun. I have a question. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I'm okay. So my question is as follows: the people who are sun people, um, do you would you say that they have the capacity to like um, in this lifetime in this world to see? And to like be kind to moon people because let's say after 121 like they get up to the next world is it going to be like god is going to be like um like this is a really important part of life that like there's going to be consequences in how you treated these people or it's going to be like i gave you like i didn't give you those kalim to be able to interact in a positive way with those people and like not that they'll get a slide but there's not going to be so much ding on them right but we just don't know because we're not god <laughs> right i think it's closer to the last point but uh, l l l let me say like this you, you you see the way that we're trying to understand this we're already looking at this from like three to four different perspectives to try to understand what what these two people are and we're also saying that we're each of us is a mix of those two things Right? So to say that there's a certain person who, who is just completely, really bad sun person and is, is, like, is like really off the mark and is never going to do what they're supposed to do and is, right? It's hard to say such a thing. And I'm sure that most people we know are some type of a mix of the two things. And it's really hard for us to judge and to, and to know what's going to be at the end of their lives. Who knows what their struggles are? Who knows what they're going through? Right? And and in Yitz Hashem, they'll, they'll they'll accomplish what they need to accomplish. But on the other hand, I, I know that's that's a that's a that's a non-answer, but I'm sticking with it. But on the other hand, on the other hand, we see one of the main concepts 
of this of, of this of this the story, the lost princess, at the very beginning, right? Is that a person first has to wake up? A per, right? Like first first you're asleep. And you don't even know anything about, about the lost princess, right? First, there has to be a recognition and, a, and an awakening to the, to the idea that there's a princess in the first place. And I would say, humbly speaking, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's totally correct or not, but I, I believe that, 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 that it, may, it could be that a sun person is just a moon person that hasn't woken up yet. Are they, that, and we can, I think we can say that everybody has the ability and is going to be afforded the chances to do what they have to do. You know, and I, I know people, I know people, a lot of people actually, who were in a certain m- mode of existence and they were very focused on things like money and status and, and, uh, and, and, you know, like those things that we would call sun people things. And you know what happened to them? Some events happened to them that were jarring and difficult and shook them to their soul and woke them up. And from that point, they started searching and they started looking. And Baruch Hashem, they, they found a path and they started growing and growing and growing. And they realized that, I don't know if they realized they were always moon people. I, I think that's the way I would like to see it. But, but, or they had a change. And they started on the, on the journey and they, and they started being a moon person. And, they, they, and, and, and you know, like, uh, like Sandra was saying, you know, and, and, and it looked like, I'm like, what's wrong with me? Shuli was saying this. A person has, has, you know, after, after being a moon person for a while, a person can look at themselves and say, oh my gosh, like, what is wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? How, I'm such a nebuch, <laughs> right? I'm just always up and down and it's like, right? But when a person is on the journey and they continue on the journey, their eyes are going to be opened and they're going to start to see things and they're going to get to that level when they can stand in front of the sun person and the sun person can stare them down from a great height and say, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. This is a fairy tale, right? And, and this moon person, after a period of growth, can look at, up at that sun person and say, you're wrong. I know I'm on the right path and I'm doing it. So I think really, it, it could be that everyone can be a moon person. That everybody can wake up and start, and, start, and start on their journey. That's the way I would like to think of it. I can't say if it's completely right or not, though. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All the best. There, what do so, you got? I wanted to say that, you know, the sun is the sun, and it doesn't really change. It rises, it sets, right? It's constant. It takes off, you know, with heat and light. The moon, though, is always in a state of, of revision and evolution. It's a, it's a state of rebirth all right. the time. So sometimes it's small, and sometimes it's big, and sometimes it's just a crescent, and sometimes it's half or full. Um, but it also takes the light from the sun, so it's always reflective. And I think most of the time you don't see them together, but when you do, it's so beautiful, right? So I think that they can shine together. Mm-hmm. It just has to have that balance and to know like where to draw the line, just like anything else, have that balance between them. Um, so that was the first. That's a really interesting uh, point perspective. So, yeah. j- so just when we. When we finished the chapter and I was kind of thinking about it, I, I wrote down this note here mm-hmm. saying, we see though that the Viceroy still requires the help of this sun person. Right. He right. still needs this giant yeah. to set him along the next stage of his journey. Right. So I'm not quite sure what to make of that. But like you're saying, 100%, the moon does need to receive its light from the sun Absolutely. right now. So what we do with that exactly, I, I guess we'll have to... We'll, yeah, we'll have to see. I mean, the the story is, is multi, especially when we're going into different interpretations. Yeah. There's multi layers, and we have to we're mixing interpretations together also. But yeah. remember, in the first interpretation of Rabbi Yaakov Klein, this is a tzaddik. It's just it's just a tzaddik who's always been a tzaddik, and and that tzaddik can certainly shine light that, that can be received right. by that's by, true. By, by the vice. So with that, with we that... comp- we compared the tzaddik in the earlier chapter with the, with the kerchief, right? That we, we 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 said that we, we, we said the sun represents a tzaddik. Right. right. But so. if the sun disappears, yeah. the moon gets no light. So you know it, it, they really do need each other, and it's also what makes the world go around. Right. That's how Hashem created the world. Right. right? So there's a, a time and a place for everything and everyone. So we need our sun people. We need our moon people. But we need them to interact with each other. Right. In a right. positive way. 
I was also going to say one more thing regarding that tree. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about it being out of um, the ground, and so it's not rooted. Um, so I know last year you took the trip out to the Maritimes because we did that oh, yeah. just now. Oh, really? So did you go to Hopewell Rocks, which is in um, the Bay of Fundy? No. So, okay, so that's where the tide goes out, and then you can walk the ocean floor, and then it comes back in. So the guide that was there was explaining, um, they're called the flower pots, because it goes back, I'm not gonna say the whole story now because it's long, but this painter painted this thing and he went home and told his wife, these are like the biggest natural flower pots ever. And anyway, that's how it got his name. Um, but the guide was explaining that these rocks um, were don't really change. It takes hundreds of years before they can change or, or um, cut off or anything like that but he said there are trees on top of these rocks and you would think like how are they surviving they can survive for hundreds of years it's because their roots go down so many feet or meters or whatever he was saying um, and the only time this was going back to what you were saying the only time they ever lost a tree was when the entire rock broke off and so the tree was separated from, wow. from the rest of the rock and the roots so they went so deep down the, so these yeah, roots. so it got completely severed, Amazing. and that's why um, that's the only time that they lose trees up there. Wow! So um, so it kind of reminded me of the guy carrying the. I mean, it doesn't matter how big the tree is and how many branches and roots it has. Once right. it's out, it's yeah. gonna rot and die. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You need to continue to feed it. Right. Very good. Very very good. Okay, Chavra. Anybody else, or should we? We'll we'll wrap it up for this week. Thank you, everybody, for participating, and we'll uh, see the Lukutimaran people on Wednesday at nine o'clock. And we'll uh, I'm actually going to be away next week, out of town, but Amr Tashem will do the same thing like we did last week, and I'll do the the shear from wherever I am on Zoom. Okay, everybody, have an amazing, awesome, super duper week. Good night. All right. Okay. Okay. Okay.